Hello, everybody. My name is Joey, and I'm with HBYOB. To my right, or to your right, I have Richard with Escarpment Laboratories. How are you, Richard? I'm great. How are you? Great. And to the bottom there, I have Chris with Santana Beer Labs. How are you, Chris? Pretty good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. We wanted to get everybody on um, to kind of do a Q&A, meet and greet. Um, we're excited here at the store here at HBYOB to have uh, Escarpment's uh, beer uh, strains available, yeast strains. Uh, Chris was, uh, is the importer who's going to be bringing them into us, making sure they're staying fresh and cold and all that good stuff. Um, so, I, uh, Richard, if you got a moment, um, just kind of let everyone know wh- wh- how'd you guys start? Where where are y'all from? You home brewers? Uh, that's how it always starts, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. We so yeah, Escarpment Labs kind of started from a few lab geeks getting together and home brewing. Really, um, my business partner Angus and myself were working in a research lab at the University of Guelph. Uh, Guelph is the city that, that we're still based in uh, and, and just uh, so happened to be that all three of the founders of the company went to University of Guelph at different times uh, and, uh, you know, learned microbiology. Um, we were working in this research lab, working on yeast research, not necessarily, you know, specifically uh, for beer, but kind of getting curious about about beer and, 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 and brewing and, you know, both had a little bit of home brewing background, and I think just being in that environment allowed us to really explore uh, what yeast could do and get familiar with it. So uh, we sort of ended up on the side uh, making this company, Escarpin Labs, and um, brought on this third guy, uh, Nate Ferguson, who's kind of our technical wizard, who um, who also came through that yeast lab at, at the University of Guelph. Um, and then we started this company with this idea of supplying uh, great yeast to breweries in Canada. Um, that is an important point. We're up here in Canada. Uh, at the time, there was really no one doing the fresh liquid yeast thing in Canada, like no one doing the you know, White Labs Y yeast kind of thing. So we saw that opportunity and decided to have a go at it. And it, it turns out it worked out pretty okay. You know, we're here uh, almost six years later. Uh, the company's grown a fair bit, um, you know, to the point where, you know, we're comfortable now sending yeast outside of Canada. And then that includes the U.S. and that includes uh, partnering with people like Chris to, to help make it a little bit easier to get some of our products. Because, you know, as time goes on, we, we're not really just selling the same yeasts that you might get from, you know, White Labs up in Canada. We're, you know, trying to carve out our, our own niche for ourselves and offer things that are unique uh, and interesting and cutting edge as well. Awesome. So, so Chris, that means... Uh- you are going to be dis- distributing them to all the people here in the U.S. Yep. Um, do you have a back? Do you have a background home brewing? You know, kind of how long? How long have you been at it? I, I've been home brewing for over, over ten years now. It's it's been a blur. I don't remember exactly when I started. It was a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> I've been brewing for about ten years. Um, I have a science background. I mean, I have a PhD in cell biology. So early on, I got interested in sort of the more of the science behind brewing. I quality control for local breweries, packaging testing, microbial testing, and the like. Um, I do some banking for local breweries, some small-scale propagations for local breweries. I mean, I don't have any big systems, so three barrels about my limit in terms of what I can grow for people. And I have a, probably a yeast bank right now, about 80 to 90 strains that I maintain. And look, this was looking to ex- start to expand the sort of the homebrew side of things. Everything I was doing is more of the, the professional brewer service side and knew of Richard and Escarpment and liked their stuff. And it kind of went from there. Awesome. Awesome. So, so Richard, you guys based out of Canada, uh, is us the first, is that the first uh, country outside of Canada that you guys have starting to go into? No, actually we, we have, uh, you know, that's sort of the funny thing is, is, uh, we at the start uh, found it easier to export to Europe. There were there were less rules to export yeast into some of the European countries than there mm-hmm. than there are in the U.S. Um, every time we send a shipment to the U.S., we have to tell we have to file uh, a bunch of paperwork with the FDA telling them that you know oh my God a live organism is coming into the country. Uh, here's all the information. So it's a little bit trickier in the U.S. Although we've we've got better systems now to to sort of make it easier and standardize it. And we we've you know it's not our first rodeo. Um, so yeah, we did a little bit of sales in in Europe before before um, you know having yeast more widely available in the U.S. 
Yeah, I know even just here, you know, HBYOB stands for Homebrew Your Own Beer. And one of the big reasons for that is because our shipping boxes and stuff, as soon as they see the word beer on it, the, you know, they'll they'll get pulled, they'll, you know, they'll come back, you know, it, it runs into a bunch of issues. So that was one of the reasons why we went the acronym that way when, when it's on a box, you know who it's from, but it doesn't have the word beer on it because <laughs> it starts getting flagged and, you know, all kinds of good stuff like that. So yeah, it's, I, I would brew your own yeast samples. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they're in, up there in Canada. I would assume there your guys is, you know, I actually got started from Craig tube. I don't know if you know who that is. Uh, he's a Canadian uh, that I started watching his videos shoot over 10 years ago. Now, um, you know, big thing for him was, you know, the taxes up there in uh, Canada being so, ex so expensive. A lot of people get into home brewing as more of a, you know, feasible option is you know, much cheaper than if you went and bought at store versus here in the United States. I mean, you, you save a little bit of money. I mean, we all know Chris can vouch for this. I, I'm not sure you ever going to save money home brewing uh, your own beer because we're always buying new equipment and stuff, but it's more of a hobby here. I can see, you know, is that, is that accurate or is that just something that kind of from, you know, what I'd seen 10 years ago? Uh, I mean, is the homebrew community real strong up there in Canada? It's definitely a strong homebrewing community. I, I'm not sure if people are doing it to save, to save money. I mean, beer is definitely more expensive here than it, than it is in the states um th that being said you know home brewing is uh you know can can be a little bit of a uh you know a rabbit hole uh <laughs> financially as well a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um so i i don't know but but we do have a really strong home brewing community like i think and that's that's you know always been the case and you know even for us as a yeast supplier that's i think one of the you know things that's really supported us and kind of been part of the backbone for us is that we have all of these homebrewers here uh, in ontario and then you know now across canada that have supported us and you know been willing to spend a couple extra bucks on the local option um especially early on when we we didn't really have those economies of scale and you know had to charge a little bit more to to, to get the yeast to the people and now it's a little bit easier to do things like uh you know bulk discounts and stuff like that but early on you know we had a lot of really good support from the local home brewers and even when you know the <laughs> i just think back to like when we were first selling the yeast and it was in these like little bottles and uh handwritten labels and it was crazy uh, but people still still tried it and and i really appreciate that so so what would you say are your flagship you know yeast strains out there top three what are what, what do we need to try first it's a little bit different between homebrew and pro but i would say on the homebrew side um the top the the, the top one right now uh is is a yeast called uh crispy uh which is a kvike that's that's kind of intended for clean beers uh, so okay. similar to some of the other options out there, like Oslo and Lutra, um, mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. just, it's awesome because you can use it to make super clean beers at pretty much any temperature. So people really like it for the homebrew side. Um, and then also our foggy London ale, that's very popular, you know, across the board, uh, for hazy IPAs, it's, you know, one of the best options. So people really like that one. Um, and then I think beyond that right now, and, and it's always shifting a little bit, but, um, we also have um our horn and dog bike which is a lot fruitier it's a lot more expressive than the crispy um that one's very popular too because you can you can use it for a lot of things um you know it's great for ipas it's great for cleaner beers uh once again like the temperature control doesn't really uh matter too much so um we're just really really versatile and i think that's what a lot of people home brewing uh really really like um you know as a feature so uh, William asks, please explain the yeast for, for variant esters and uh, flavor profiles. Uh, William, uh, on HBYOB.com, the ones we have here in store, um, has the profiles on there. Um, if you go to uh, Santana's uh, website, you can also get a lot of the uh, ester and flavor profiles there for that information. Um, so th those would be good resources if you're looking to want to use one of those. Um so, so, so it sounds like I, I just know from the things that we have gotten in here and with the popularity of Kvike strains, it definitely seems like you guys have, have got quite a few options there. I mean, we just started picking up or not just started, but we, you know, Omega um, yeast is one of the, one of the carriers we have just basically for the Kvike strains because they have such a good selection versus some of the others, um, some of the older school companies. Um, it, uh, I heard you talk earlier the, about the ring. Did I get that right? Yeah, the Kvike ring. Yeah, so, so it, I'm horrible when it comes to Kvike chains. So explain to people what what is a Kvike ring? Where does it come from? What how, how does it work? 
if there are. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to dig into here. So, I mean, yeah, Kvike is this, uh, you know, really special yeast from Norway, but it's a whole family of yeast. There's lots of different ones. So even if you try one Kvike you might not like, you're probably going to find one that's going to work great for you. Um, mm -hmm. A Kvike ring traditionally is this, I, I don't have one here, but it's this braided piece of wood um, that would be... One up while you're telling. <laughs> Uh, that would be uh, traditionally used. It's sort of this, it looks really cool. It's like this almost like a spine kind of shape uh, that the brewer would put into their uh, their beer when it's fermenting, you know, when you've got a little bit of that yeast foam on top and they could, you know, dip it in the beer, hang it up by the fire, let it dry out. And then they've got their dry yeast that's ready to use for the next uh, batch of beer that they brew. So a really sort of uh, simple uh, tool to, there you go. Yeah, you got one right there. Um, and then our, our, our design from, yeah. straight from your website. Yeah. That is straight from the, <laughs> great. Um, so yeah, the, this thing's got a ton of surface area so it can pick up a lot of yeast, dry it out. And then they could just toss that into the next batch. The yeast goes into the wort. It starts fermenting. So kind of this really cool, uh, but very old, you know, three, 400 year old, uh, tool for reusing yeast. And, you know, I think in terms of the Kvike ring for escarpment, one of the, uh, what we can talk about is uh, we've sort of taken that that concept or that that name and turned that into a um, what we call the Kvike ring at escarpment, it, which is a, a monthly release of a new Kvike um, because there's so many of these things, right? It's not just one yeast; it's a whole family of yeasts, and every Norwegian farmer's Kvike is a little bit different. And there's also Kvike-like things, you know, uh, farmhouse yeasts and other places. So, you know, one of our problems was there's so many of these things out there, it's pretty much impossible to make every single yeah. one of them available to brewers. So uh, we kind of came up with the strategy to force ourselves to get more of these things out there in the world and say, okay, we're gonna release a new one every month. We'll, uh, you know, maybe we won't get as much rigorous testing as we would for a normal strain that becomes part of our main portfolio, but we're gonna get it out there and then we can make it a collaborative product, uh, process of, uh, you know, us and the home brewers and the, and the breweries uh, testing out these strains or blends and uh, figuring out what they can do. And then the ones that are, you know, show a lot of promise or that people keep asking us about, we'll bring them back and they'll become mainstays. Okay. Uh, Chris, do you mind, uh, uh, Ashley asked, what's your favorite Kvike for high gravity stouts and barley wines? Do you have any uh, take there? Uh, Voss would be great. Uh, the, the, actually, the most recent release of the Kvike ring uh, the ravines is that how you pronounce that, Richard? Ravenous. Ravenous. <laughs> Ravenous. Okay. I'm American. Uh, it's ravines. <laughs> Ravenous. Yeah. So that one also is very vast. Uh, I, I, it took me years to learn the Norwegian. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, those, uh, Mike, those, actually, yeah, those are pretty nice. Mike asked a good question. Uh, I, I know the answer to this one. Uh, the cell count per pack. I did notice it's not like, uh, you know, White Labs or Imperial or, you know, any of the other competitors. You guys are actually doing some good due diligence and they, they do vary a little bit from strain to strain. Am I correct in, in that? Yeah, you are correct. So the pitch rates do depend on the strain. Uh, we try to target what we think is optimal for each strain. So for the clean strains, like the ales, like clean ales and lagers, uh, we target at least 180 billion cells per pack. So that's that's about, you know, double the, you know, sort of white lab standard and um, about where you might see Omega and Imperial. So very similar. Um, you know, the goal there is let's let's pr let's provide a, you know, the right amount of yeast for Correct. a standard batch of beer. And then for some of the other strains we do go a little lower. Like for some of the Belgian strains for example, we go a little lower because Makes we sense. think those strains are more expressive when they're when there's yep. a, a slightly lower pitch rate. Yeah, I certainly know a lot of a lot of the Hefeweizens will ask for you know to, to slightly under pitch yeah. so you can really get that banana clove out. Um, so so when you say standard, you're talking like a five gallon batch of beer, right? Yeah, five gallon, twenty liter kind okay. of thing. Yeah, yeah, I forget them. <laughs> uh, uh, we, we're still stuck on that old uh, <laughs> uh, system. <laughs> uh, we do both. Okay. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> oh, trust me, it makes way more sense. <laughs> But uh, what's okay, nice, though, if you look at the packages, they actually give the cell count for each of the different types on their packages. So there's no guessing. You pick up the package, you see what it is, and you know exactly what it is. Yeah, it's very. we try to be as transparent as possible. And what would you say is the shelf life? You know, if someone gets it from my store, um, does it does it give a born on date, expiration date, or how long do you recommend? Obviously, it's going to be a little, you know, strain specific, but, um, you know, what would be a general shelf life of, of your yeast? 
Yeah. So, I mean, again, just in the interest of transparency, we try to make it, you know, as clear as possible, you know, when the yeast was packaged and when it's expiring, right? There's nothing that you have to decode. So it'll have, it'll have the package date. It'll have the expiry date. Um, by default, our expiry date is four months from the package date. So um, okay. that's a little bit, a little bit more narrow than, uh, than, than, than some of the, some of the yeast providers, but you know, that's kind of our goal is try to make sure that people have the best experience possible. So uh, what I will say is that a lot of the strains, even at four months, they they can be quite viable and quite healthy. Although if it's getting up there, like if it's if it's within a month of expiry, that's the kind of situation where I usually recommend make a starter, and then it's it's totally you know good to go. Um, but it does depend on the strains, and what you'll probably see from us in the future is you might see uh, shelf life change depending on the strain because there's some that we know are are actually perfect at six months but there's others that yeah. we know like maybe maybe three months is the max yeah i mean logger strains never seem to to keep <laughs> for very long but yet those kvike strains i think you could pitch those five years later and they'd still rock and roll so yeah. de definitely de definitely makes a lot of sense um the uh yeast when you ship them here you know we're based in ohio uh, uh, that's where chris is um, you know, how do you, how do you package them? Are they packed on ice packs? How, how you know, what method of shipping generally are they? A lot of ice packs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we got a, yeah, we got a good deal on ice packs. Uh, <laughs> and that's great for the shops too, because then you get free ice yeah. packs, right. Uh, yeah. that you can use to, to ship out your yeast. Um, yeah. Uh, the reality with shipping into the U S is sometimes there are delays. Um, mm -hmm. in, in general, it is, it is actually for, for most um for most us destinations it's it's a day or two so it's pretty quick um but mm -hmm. sometimes there's delays so we do tend to you know pack them with a lot of ice um mm -hmm. i think chris actually posted a picture today because i think some yeast showed up today so you can actually yep. see you know what the boxes look like and and you know how they're kind of packed with uh with ice and it looked like the ice was still frozen which is awesome yep um mm -hmm. yeah we so ordered this they shipped this yesterday we got it today yeah yeah, I mean that that's one of the things, you know, with liquid yeast strains, it's it's great to have a local home brew shop because that way you can guarantee, you know, we've we've handled it properly, it's got to us properly and um, you know, when when Chris brought us our first delivery uh not too long ago, same thing, you know, they were on ice packs, I added it to my collection of Gremlin ice packs in the freezer in the back room here. Um and so that's you know it's fantastic some of most of the, or all of the other yeast distributors you know they come direct to me from the distributor so you know i you know i ensure and you know same thing you know put my hands on and make sure everything's still cold grab the ice packs make sure very rarely do we have ballooning but i do know certain strains do balloon generally i mean whether mm -hmm. it just it's just the nature of the strain even stored properly because uh, i do get it a lot where people you know will they'll sift through the the yeast packs and like oh these are balloon i'm like there's just certain strains that just balloon even if kept extremely cold i mean uh william houston asks uh does colder refrigeration or freezing extend their shelf life you know what would you write i do have uh i just got them not too long ago you know little uh, thermostats inside the refrigerator we store ours around 34 to 34 35 36 degrees you know within that range right. do you recommend a certain temperature i know freezing's bad unless you uh um, use uh, Chris would know better than me. I, I can't. Is it like propylene glycol when you bank it? Typically glycerol if you're banking it, but you can't store that. It well, you can't even at minus twenty with glycerol. This, the viability is still going to be pretty poor, especially in a, a modern freezer that has free thaw cycles. You can kind of mm -hmm. bury it in the middle in a box with ice packs and try to mitigate the temperature changes, but. Mm -hmm. I mean, typically glycerol storage is done at a minus 80 or liquid nitrogen. Yeah. For, for a homebrew pack, um, basically the closer you go to freezing, the better without freezing it. Uh, if, mm -hmm. if, it if it freezes, the yeast will die pretty fast. But yeah, that you said for 34 to 36 Fahrenheit, like, yeah, one to three Celsius is ideal. Like we we try to keep our, our cold rooms at two Celsius, for example, um, just to try to, you know, make sure that we're, storing the yeast in the best possible conditions okay well frank asks he wants to know a good a good strain that you would recommend for a kolsch um i was provided a a nice poster that i'm going to hang up um that has a lot of the you know nice. kind of substitutions and beer recommendations uh anyone off the top of your head you'd recommend for a kolsch kolsch 
Kolsch. <laughs> we, well, yeah, we have a string called Kolsch that's great for that. Oh, really uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, How appropriately named. <laughs> you said crispy um, earlier. and uh, crispy, okay. crispy would be awesome for a Kolsch too, though. So mm, I, I, I would... would uh, that's what I was thinking immediately, yeah. yeah. It's great for that application. Well, cool. So, I mean, so do, I guess, uh, another question I have is, do you do, uh, you know, now with, as people come in and try these and experiment with these yeasts, um, a lot of breweries are probably going to be, um, wanting to come to me. Cause I do, I do a lot of business with breweries and do you do brewery size pitches? Um, you know, one barrel, two barrel, um, size pitches, or are you more on the home brewing side of things? Are you there? I, I would say, uh, yep. Yeah, I would say brewery okay. business is our is is our bread and butter. Uh, that that's the majority of the yeast that we make is going to to breweries. But you know, obviously, the the homebrew side is really important. So, um, yeah, we can do any size pretty much. Um, we have um, pretty good capacity to produce lots of lots of yeast for breweries um, at this point. So, uh, yeah, if breweries want to pick up a you know one barrel or ten barrel or 50 barrel pitch we can make that happen awesome and w w what i would recommend though because shipping from canada is not inexpensive no so if we get the best thing would be to try to combine these around one of my bulk shipments mm -hmm. but that way the shipping is basically averaged out over hundreds of packs of yeast yeah for sure shipping four boxes is a you know Four, shipping four boxes to one place is a lot cheaper than shipping four boxes to four places, to put it that way. Yeah, and even depending on if it's a one or two barrel pitch, just getting them, including it in the same box. Oh yeah, no, no problem. Yeah. And as far as your brew day goes, if if you're not making a starter, do you any any special? Um, you know, obviously, Y yeast has some of the smack packs. Um, you know, so I know Imperial asks to just keep it refrigerated until you pitch it. Um, do, do you recommend, you know, when you start your brew day, putting it on the counter, letting it get to room temperature, you know, kind of how, you know, say I'm, I'm getting ready to start my brew day tomorrow morning. What do I do? If it's fresh, just take it out and use it. You can pitch it cold. You can let it warm up. Uh, in my experience, it doesn't make a huge difference. Uh, okay. you know, keep it simple. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll often let it warm up a little bit because I just find it a little easy to break up the if it's settled down. Yeah, yeah. For some of the chunky yeast, warming it up helps a lot. Yeah, or some of the English know. and stuff like that, just to be able to get it all into solution. Yeah, my pro tip for the English strains is like open the pouch, put a little wort in, and that'll help uh, break up the yeast as well. Yeah, yeah. I uh, the first time I the first time I used Imperial. It said, you know, keep refrigerated until you pitch. And I was like, oh, they don't know what they're talking about. You know, me being a dummy. And I'm like, oh, they don't know what they're talking about. They're just, you know, they just know more, way more about yeast than me. So I threw it out on the counter and I went to pitch it. I put the pouch next to my ear. It was making this like rice crispy treats just crackling, just going on. I'm like, oh my gosh, I should have listened. I pitched it like not even two hours later. It was all over the place. I was like, oh, probably should have not been a know-it-all in this situation. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I definitely, like I said, I, I, a lot of customers will ask me, you know, you know, what went, how, you know, uh, they'll ask me exactly you know when my brew day starts what do i do do i leave it in the fridge do i leave it out it does seem like you know just kind of like the cell count and a lot of other variables it sounds a little um strain oriented for the most part would you agree with that mm -hmm. well cool do you have any any cool strains lined up in the future um how many how many how many strains do you have in total right now do you know off the top of your head approximately depends how you count i mean we have I think we just put the 1600 thing into the into the frozen bank so there's lots lots in there in reserve okay yeah. <laughs> waiting to be used um can't can't talk about everything that's coming down the pipeline sure. but we're we're trying to hit you know a lot of the things that uh that that brewers are excited about um you know in terms of in, at least in terms of the yeast and fermentation world uh this year so you know hoping to to have some of those options for you know a little bit more uh, selection for uh, like lacto for sour beers. I uh, might get into some of the sour, you know, there's, there's yeasts that can make sour beer as well. Um, and, and we're going to probably have a few more of our, our hybrids. Um, so uh, for example, we just launched our first hybrid in the fall called Gotun. Um, it's a hybrid of Kvike and a Saison yeast. So it's kind of this uh, very scary super yeast that is 
You know, you can pitch it at any temperature. It's fast fermenting. It flocculates. Uh, it does a lot of things, and it's, it's and it's diastatic, so it totally dries out the beer, like That's down to beer down to oh oh four or lower. So uh, we're pretty excited about that one. The things that it can do, and you'll see more of these these hybrids from us this year as well. Yeah, that's been real popular here so far. That and the Bretts and the Brett blends. I've been selling. A, I mean, we've been selling strains now for about two weeks here in the mm -hmm. U.S., and I've sold over eighty packs. Yeah, that's awesome, and, and, and I think that's also the, you know the most popular. The Mothership and the Brett and the Blinner and the really? Brett have been the most popular. Awesome. Well, bring bring back Brett. I know that uh, I know that you know Brett's kind of gone through a few years of being maybe maybe kind of losing popularity, but I mean I think it's coming back. I think uh, you know I, I think a lot of us have forgot about Brett, but uh, you know are getting back into it and you know loving the things it can do. And you know it's always been a priority for us is having you know really really great Brett strains. Yeah, I think part of the problem with that has been education. People hear Brett the first the only thing they think of is horse blanket. The barnyard mm -hmm. horse blanket, and it's mm -hmm. so more complex. That's certainly a component yeah. of it, but it's so so much more complex than that. Well, for years I didn't like saisons because you know you you just thought of barn you know barnyard and you know all all the you know, I just thought saisons are just way too estery, and then I learned I was totally wrong. There's a lot of very enjoyable, even if your palate isn't ready for you know certain saisons that you would enjoy quite a bit. So um, yeah, we, we need to bring. Brett, Black, Brett back. <laughs> well, cool. I, I appreciate so much for your time, Richard and Chris. Um, we're going to kind of wrap things up here. Anything before any closing thoughts before we go? I know a lot of people have shown quite a bit of interest. Uh, I have a feeling we're going to, you know, experiment. I, I'm glad we had this cast. I would have thought Cal Yale would have been your guys's, you know, most popular ones. I didn't get hardly any of the Brett lactose strains. Now I need to get those. So I've learned quite a bit myself. <laughs> Yeah, I will. I will be getting them on order. Um, like I said, you can get them from either hbyob.com. Uh, Chris, what's your what's your website? SonataBeerLabs.com. I saw that you can ship uh, the couple. Uh, if you know, ship to I think five packs is. Yeah, we do flat rate that. shipping up to five packs for nine dollars. Okay, so if you want to get them here in store, like I said, Chris brings them direct to me. Nice. Um, so and I have you know when you walk in the store, you can see the refrigerator we keep the refrigerator where we keep them all. So they're handled properly in the meantime, especially, you know, the winter time, probably not as much of concern, but in the summertime, definitely stop in store and come pick those up. So you can ensure that they're handled properly. Um, like I said, before any closing thoughts, Richard, before we get off here. No, I, I want to, you know, I want to say thanks to Chris for, uh, you know, taking, taking the chance on partnering with us. I think it's, I think it's working out very well. You know, we've, we've got a lot of folks that know about us that down in the States and uh, it's really exciting to make this stuff more accessible. Like that, that's amazing. You know, $9 flat rate shipping to, to get the yeasts where it needs to go. You know, that's really exciting. We've sort of been active in a lot of, uh, you know, American communities, things like milk the funk, which is, you know, where I've, you know, been for years and years and years talking about things like Brett and sour beer. So uh, it's cool to, you know, catch up with people who who know me from that and uh can can finally try out some of these uh yeasts so that also might be what you might be seeing uh people picking up a lot of the brett and sour stuff but it doesn't mean that cali ale's not great um you know we try to have a pretty balanced lineup yeah that's that's where i met that's where i learned about you guys with milk the funk so shout out to milk the funk <laughs> and, and american home brewers <laughs> well Chris, any any uh, final thoughts before we wrap things up here for the day? Uh, no, just thanks for having us. Thanks for uh, carrying the yeast, and uh, we'll keep trying to keep all the newest strains available, and let's try to make some good beer. So yeah, I appreciate everyone for tuning in. If you're watching it now, if you're watching it, you know, down the road from now, um, come visit us here in the store. Give them a try, and uh, hopefully we can we can get this uh, rocking and rolling. And we'd love to get feedback. It, Obviously, to have people as nice as Richard and Chris to come on here, it's companies that really care about you know customers getting exactly what they're what they want, and it sounds to me like they'll definitely listen to any feedback you may have, and it'd be a great partnership here. So uh, I look forward to the future. And uh, with that being said, cheers everybody, and I'll see you on the next one. Right, take care now.